Timmy coming at you again today, and today what we're going to talk about is the electrical activity of the heart and how the electrical activity of the heart produces the EKG or ECG. So again, any part of the body that produces electricity relies on electrolytes to produce that electrical activity. So any time you have an electrolyte imbalance, you always worry about the heart. The two main systems, if you want to simplify it even more, is anytime you have electrolyte disturbances, you worry about the cardiovascular system and the nervous system. So in classes where you have fluid and electrolyte and acid-base balance, those are the things that you think about. So first of all, before we begin our discussion, I got to review a couple of things that you learned in AMP, right? Number one, the heart's unique. And the heart is unique because it can generate and sustain its own electrical activity. Let me give you an example. If somebody has a spinal cord injury, right, let's say a, I don't know, a high thoracic spinal cord injury, they will not be able to move their skeletal muscle because skeletal muscle cannot generate its own electrical activity. It relies on nerves from the brain and spinal cord to stimulate the muscle to contract. But your heart still contracts. That's because inside the heart, there are specialized cells that can generate their own electrical activity. And that makes sense, right? Look, if the heart didn't do that, if it relied on nerves from your spinal cord to contract like skeletal muscle do, then you couldn't transplant a person's heart because you would have to remove the donor heart, their brain and spinal cord because you need the spinal cord to stimulate the heart. Then you would have a different person. Let's say that person happened to be a murderer or, worse yet, somebody who didn't read the textbook. Yeah, think about that. Anyways, I'm digressing, but here we go. So that's a unique feature in the heart. And what allows the heart, even though it's made of a, a gazillion individual cells, to function as a unit is heart cells have unique features. They have these little gap junctions. And what these gap junctions do, I ain't the best drawer, is you have a heart cell here. And then you have another heart cell here. All right. What allows it to function as a unit is embedded in the cell membrane of heart cells are these little tunnels. They're called gap junctions. And what it does is it allows electrolytes to flow freely from one heart cell to the next. It's almost instantaneous. So when the heart develops its electrical activity, it can spread instantly over all the heart cells because of these gap junctions. And that's not found in other muscle cells. You don't want part of your heart to take a day off. Wouldn't make a lot of sense. The other thing that heart cells have are these things called intercalated discs. And basically what they do is they tie individual heart cells together. So when the electrical impulse travels over the heart cells and causes the muscle cells of the heart to contract, they contract as a unit. And that's beautiful. A couple of things you absolutely have to know. Watch. You got atria and you got ventricles. The ventricles are the primary pumps, right? If your right and left ventricle don't pump, you are, well, here, we'll play hangman, right? Let's do it. I'm going to say D. Good, Timmy, that's right. 
I'm gonna guess E, yup. And then A, yeah, and then D, yeah. Timmy, I'm gonna solve the puzzle. Okay, you're dead. So if your right and left ventricle don't contract, that's bad for you. There are some people who walk around and their atria don't contract so well. As a matter of fact, their atria are kind of spazzes. They don't contract, they just quiver. But they do just fine. They're not going to pole vault or shot put, but they can go to Aunt Bessie's house and drink Kool-Aid. And they have a condition called atrial fibrillation. So the primary pumps are the ventricles and the atria. What's important to understand is that the atria function as a unit. So when the right atria is contracting, the left atria is contracting, and the ventricles function as a unit. When the right ventricle contracts, so does the left. And the heart has basically two cell types, right? One that produces the electrical activity, the electrical conduction system of the heart, and the cells that contract, the muscle cells. So what I'm going to concentrate on today are the cells that produce the electrical activity. So here we go. All right, you got this lovely little video here. And let me begin to explain a little bit. Number one, the pacemaker of the heart, or what sets the normal rate of the heart, is a specialized group of cells that can generate and sustain their own electrical activity called the sinoatrial node. Or the SA node. And the sinoatrial node sets the pace. So it fires an electrical impact, uh, impulse regularly over that entire minute. And normally it fires at a rate of about 60 to 80. That's why the normal resting heart rate is about 60 to 80. Now, what do heart cells have? They have gap junctions and intercalated discs. So what do those gap junctions and intercalated discs do? They allow, the gap junctions allow the electrical impulse that was first generated by the SA node to travel instantly over both the right and left atria. And because they have intercalated discs, the right and left atria will contract as a unit, just like you want. So. On an EKG, right, when you put the electrodes on the person's chest, you will see the P wave. So the P wave represents the electrical impulse that was generated in the SA node traveling over both the right and left atria. And to simplify it even further, this little P wave represents atrial contraction. It's a little bit different, but right now we're kind of working on this uh, little simple. So take it at that. Now watch. The atria are not the primary pumps. The atria just provide a little extra blood into both the right and left ventricle. So you don't want the atria to contract at the same time as the ventricles. So to prevent that from happening, and of course, the body does stuff that makes sense, separating the atria from the ventricles is a little like a rubber washer. It's a little insulating ring called the fibrous non-electrical conducting ring. So it separates electrically, at least, the atria from the ventricles. So the impulse that's generated in the SA node cannot travel instantly to the ventricles. You don't want that, right? You want the atria to contract to push that additional blood into the ventricles before the ventricles contract. What prevents that impulse from the SA node going directly to the ventricles? Well, your little fibrous non-electrical conducting ring of the furbicna curve, or 
the little smiley face rubber washer, whatever you want to remember it as. So what happens is once that impulse is generated in the SA node, the only way in the normal electrical conducting activity of the heart that that impulse that was generated in the SA node can get to the ventricles is it has to go through the next portion of the conduction system. So all those electrical impulses that were generated by the SA node and traveled over the atria now get funneled into the next portion. And that portion is called the atrioventricular node or the AV node. Now, in the AV node, that electrical impulse sits there for a second, not a second, but a short period of time. So on an EKG, you're going to see a little tiny space right here, it's very tiny. What that does is that allows the atria to contract and push that additional blood into the ventricles. That's a good thing. Once that delay is over, that electrical impulse is then going to travel over the bundle of Hiss. And then the bundle of Hiss is splits into the left bundle branch and then the right bundle branch. So these are those specialized cells that conduct the electrical impulse. And those electrical impulses then travel to these little bifurcating fibers, these little spread out fibers called the Purkinje fibers. And what the Purkinje fibers do is they generate their electrical impulse and it will cause both the right and left ventricle to contract. And on an EKG, you see this. This is called the QRS. And simply put, it represents the right and left ventricle contracting. So the electrolytes moving through the bundle of Hiss, left and right bundle branch of Purkinje fibers, and it's going to produce the QRS. And that represents both the right and left ventricle contracting at the same time. Now, your goal in life is to get through nursing school and to have more than one heartbeat each day. So what happens is as these electrolytes move in the heart cells to produce the electrical activity, those electrolytes have to reset themselves. So after the QRS, you see another wave, and that wave is called the T wave. And what the T wave does is the T wave represents the electrolytes resetting themselves in the ventricles so that you can do it all over again. Now, the question that you should ask is, well, gee whiz, the atriar muscle too, why don't you see the, a wave for the atria resetting? The answer is, is that as the ventricles are contracting, the electrolytes in the atria are resetting. So the little QRS complex kind of covers up that repolarization of the atria. So that's the electrical conduction system through the heart couple of other things real quick. Let me get rid of some of this mess, right? What's the normal pacemaker of the heart? The normal pacemaker of the heart is the SA node. Now, you have three potential pacemakers to your heart. You have the sinoatrial node, and that's normal, and the normal rate is 60 to 80. But let's say, for example, that your SA node takes a dump. Don't work. The next pacemaker that can take over is the AV node. So the AV node, if it has to take over, its natural rate of firing is about 40 to 60. 
beats per minute. So you'll notice a significant drop in a patient's heart rate if they go, if their SA node takes a dump ski. But you can do okay, at least for a little while. Now, here comes the big problem. If your SA node and your AB node take a dump, what will take over are the Purkinje fibers. And the Purkinje fibers, unfortunately, don't cause the atria to contract. They only cause the ventricles to contract, so you lose that additional blood from the atria, so your cardiac output drops. But more importantly is the normal intrinsic rate of the Purkinje fibers is 15 to 30 beats a minute. So if your SA node takes a dump, and your AV node takes a dump, you're going to take a dump because you can't survive on a heart rate of 15 to 20 because you know that heart rate times stroke volume equals cardiac output, cardiac blood flow. So if you can't maintain blood flow to your brain and you won't be able to with a heart rate of 15, you'd be like a little top. You're up, but you're down again. The result is, is that you will become dizzy, lightheaded, weak, and you may become unconscious. So if your SA node and your AV node take Dumpsky, the Purkinje fibers become the pacemaker, and you have what's called complete heart block. That's bad for you. You should write that down. You don't want that. So what do you do for a person that has complete heart block? Well, if they're in bad shape and they come into your emergency room, then what they will do is they will externally pace that person. They'll put a big electrode on the front of them and on the back of them, and they will send out electrical impulses to stimulate the heart to contract more frequently than 15 times a minute. Then they take them to the cath lab, right? And they put a little box in the infra infraclavicular fossa. Nice, huh? And it's about the size of a Zippo lighter. And it has two wires on it. And they go in through the subclavian vein into the superior vena cava. And they dig a wire into the right atrium. And then they take another wire and they dig it into the right ventricle. And you have a pacemaker. The question that should immediately come to you is, gee whiz, Timmy, why don't you need a pacer wire in the left atria and the left ventricle? The answer is, is that remember that the right atria and left atria are electrically connected by those gap junctions. So when that pacemaker fires, it's going to stimulate the right atria, but because of gap junctions and intercalated discs, it's going to stimulate the left atria. Then there's going to be a little delay to allow the atria to contract, and then you're going to get the stimulation of the right ventricle, and same holds true, that when you stimulate the right ventricle with a little pacer wire because of gap junctions and intercalated discs, the left ventricle is going to contract. So if you were to look at somebody's EKG who has a pacer, and most pacemakers now are dual chambered, so they pace the atria on the ventricle, you're going to see this. You're going to see the P, QRS, and T wave, but what you will see is you will see a little spike there. That's a pacer spike, and that causes the atria to contract. Then you can see another pacer spike, and that is stimulating the ventricles to contract. And the resetting of the atria do it all by their lonesome. So I hope that helped. Be good and study hard.